good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to the Summit Series, and thanks for being here. I'm Pamela Steer, Chief Financial and Corporate Strategy Officer at Payments Canada, and I'll be your host today. We have a lot of ground to cover today and a large audience, so we're looking forward to talking to all of you, and we'll save time at the end for your questions, so please send them through the Q&A box on your screen. We will try to answer as many of them as time allows. I know today's panel dis discussion is going to be a lively one. In fact, we were just talking about that. So let's jump right in. We are talking about Paytex in Canada and let's start off by going around the virtual room for introductions. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. And Sue, let's start with you. Great. Thanks, Pamela. It's uh, I'm really thrilled to be here, and thanks for uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sue Britton. I am the CEO and founder of FinTech Growth Syndicate, and we are a uh, FinTech advisory firm, and we work with large companies and have the best job in the world because we get to help them um, realize new growth opportunities for their customers. Great. Well, thank you, Sue, and welcome, and thank you for joining us. And now, Doug Kravyazuk, over to you. Thanks, Pamela. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me here today. I'm the Executive Director for Paytex of Canada Association. Uh, the association in and of itself, is the mission of it is to provide a harmonized voice for Paytex in Canada in the pursuit of a positive and sustainable change for the Canadian payment system. Now, previous to uh, my current employee, I held the role of Vice President, Policy Research, Public Affairs, and Modernization at Payments Canada for some 20 years. I've also made myself available as a consultant, and in 2017, I authored the Competition Bureau's FinTech Market Study. And I'm looking forward to today. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And over to you, Antonio. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, like my, my panel, uh, uh, friends here. I'm happy to be here virtually and be part of such an important discussion regarding Paytex here in Canada. Uh, as Pamela said, I'm Andrew Holyom, Senior Director of Payment Products at Payments Canada. And in my role, I'm ultimately responsible for the business operations of our national payment systems, both retail and wholesale, or ACSS and LBTS respectively. Payments Canada, or as formerly known as the Canadian Payments Association, or CPA, was established by an act of parliament under the Canadian Payments Act in 1980 to establish and operate a national clearings and settlement system and plan the evolution of the national payment systems. We're delegated by the Canadian government to support a vibrant economy by helping meet the needs of consumers and businesses and empowering a new era of modern payments. All right, well, thank you, colleague Andrew Holyom. And now we're gonna jump right in. So the first question I'm going to direct all of you and I'll start with you, Sue. Um, we all know that Canada is in the middle of a multi-year payments modernization strategy. And what does that mean for Paytex in Canada in your perspective? Sue, again, we'll start with you, please. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I, I uh, wanted to sort of preface this with um, I joined the Stakeholder Advisory Council just over a year ago and uh, for Payments Canada and have had uh, the pleasure of um, meeting and learning from the other uh, SAC, as we like to call it, um, members. And I would say that the you know, prior to joining SAC and getting more involved and uh, understanding more about the the payments modernization agenda and the role of Payments Canada, um, there is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for Paytex as a result of the payments modernization initiatives. And, um, and you know, I think the examples um, that we can use to illustrate that are um, companies today that you, you know, if you, um, those of you who may shop on Wayfair, apparently the Wayfair is experiencing a tremendous amount of growth, just like Amazon, and you are offered an opportunity to, to uh, make an installment payment. And that installment payment might be offered by Paybright, which is a successful um, and rapidly growing Canadian pay tech. Um, and that company is one of, over 600 um, in Canada that have been, 
you know, working over the last couple of years to uh, to get to market and to grow and to gain awareness amongst um, Canadian consumers and small businesses. And that's a tough job for um, a small company, especially when you're swimming in a, an ocean with very, very large established um, financial institutions. And so one of the key things that payments modernization does, in addition to modernizing you know, systems that are long overdue to be modernized. Um, uh, and I will let my other more um, uh, esteemed payments colleagues refer to the actual systems themselves. But other than the technology change, you know, we're about to see some change in uh, the regulations or the Payments Act that will include many uh, many companies um, in the, you know, sort of regulatory oversight um, of payments in Canada. And then along with that, we are also uh, hoping to see some changes to the way we look at membership in Payments Canada or access to um, the payments systems either directly or indirectly. And all of what all that means is companies like PayBright or others might have the opportunity to do things in a way that is at, at a lower cost, is potentially uh, faster and more um, efficient for them. And ultimately all of those benefits could and should pass down to consumers and businesses. So, you know, payments modernization is pretty exciting. I, I My biggest knock against the uh, challenges, and I know we're gonna probably talk about this at some point, is um, the challenge is just getting it done faster. Thanks, Sue. I, I love the way you talked about Wayfair and its growth and PayBright in particular and the installments, as well as the, you know, it's wide ranging with the, the act changes and so forth and, and the potential benefits there. Doug, I'd like to, I know you've got a, a view on this as well, and I'd love to hear your views uh, about how you see the modernization unfolding. Yeah, thanks, Pamela. So when I first got the question, uh, the first thought that ran through my head was a strategy that's built on hope really isn't a strategy. We need action and we need to see some immediate change to prove that there is a commitment to change and that commitment is genuine. And I'm when I'm speaking, I'm not speaking just about Payments Canada, I'm speaking about Department of Finance and the Bank of Canada as well. We need the policy making community to really step up and commit to improvements to the payment system. Now, why I believe it's so important is that there's several pieces to this puzzle that need to come together to allow for a successful and improved payments ecosystem. The dependencies that exist cause a chain reaction that can either be positive or negative. For example, the delays in the infrastructure or the delays in ARPA. So for me, when I consider broadening the payment system or improvements to the payment system, I think there are a number of critical factors. First, you need the underlying legislation and regulation. You need a solid business case and industry-wide cooperation. Effective risk management, but also a commitment to introduce innovations into the marketplace. And a commitment to embrace the new players by the regulators, by the incumbents, and by politicians. And on that last point, I think we need political will to amend the underlying framework. But this seems to be missing today. There appears to be a fear that changes in the system access for Paytex will introduce unnecessary and possibly uncontrollable risk. I believe the opposite is the case. This move will create opportunities in the market and Paytex will in fact become the catalyst for change, reducing the frictions and introducing new services. By embracing this type of change, Canada still has the ability to keep pace with the global payments ecosystem. Now, despite the fact that modernization or ARPOF isn't close to implementation, we're now pushing forward open banking or consumer-directed finance. From my vantage point, I believe that this is only the beginning of future opportunities. The potential for new services and applications in the payment system are almost limitless. However, if we constrain ourselves to the traditional view of banking, this will perpetuate the historical oligopoly of the major financial institutions and the broad benefits of competition certainly will be stifled. 
So when I think about it, on the table before us, we really have two questions about moving forward on open banking and on access to the payment system for non-banks. It's a bit of the chicken and the egg problem for Canada. Because we have been slow to modernize the legal infrastructure and the frameworks, we've created a problem for ourselves. The next phase of the payments innovation has already come along, and that's open banking. And I don't think we're ready. We need the legal underpinnings to allow us to, uh, to allow us the ability to quickly and effectively embrace open banking and the further innovations that are going to come along thereafter. The these delays are causing an ice dam in policy issues. And this is causing harm not only to pay tax, but to the users of the payment system and the economy itself. The new world requires fresh and innovative thinking. If that's not possible, the policy direction for the payment system is one that needs to rely on a commitment to increasingly rely on market-oriented approaches and solutions. Thank you. Well, thanks, Doug. There was a lot there as well, moving on from, from Sue and talking about commitment to change and the underlying political requirements, as well as, as the fact that you believe certainly that the fintechs can be a catalyst for change. So thank you for that. And then last but not least, Andrew, I mean, you're in the you're in the, the thick of the payment system here at Payments Canada on a daily basis. What's your view in terms of the modernization? Thanks, Pamela. I think both Sue and Doug make some sound points here. Payments Canada has always played an influencer role in the Canadian payments ecosystem. By the nature of who we are as a public purpose financial market infrastructure provider, the role we play in connecting our ecosystem, how we're regulated, and our relationships with both our members and stakeholders, there's an inevitable tension in the system and we're in the middle of it. But I think it's important to remind ourselves of the intentions of our payments modernization program. Through the visioning work that was conducted in 2015 and 2016, Payments Canada articulated the following, and I'll quote, a modern payments system is fast, flexible, and secure, promotes innovation, and strengthens Canada's competitive position. So when I think about modernization and I reflect on the eight needs that emerged from that visioning exercise, things like faster payments, data-rich payments, transaction transparency, easier payments, activity-based oversight, open and risk-based access, a platform for innovation, and finally, enhancing cross-border opportunities. I see a place for Paytex to help address many of those needs, like Sue and like Doug. But we need to talk about the benefits as well. When I think about benefits of MOD, there are five that come to mind. First, obviously, is faster and more efficient, and that can include the rails themselves, speed and or frequency in posting to turn into accounts, like we did with our AFT enhancements project in 2018, richer data, think about ISO 20022, more convenient, interoperable. Again, let's think about ISO 20022 standard as the gateway to both domestic rail agnosticity and opening up lanes for cross-border integration based on aligning multi-jurisdictional standards. Boy, that's a mouthful. And finally, greater security and risk management and privacy. That is security that's adaptable to emerging threats as well as next generation privacy and risk management tools so that we have the most secure payments experience possible. We're working to provide that platform that will allow pay our payments ecosystem, that's both our Paytex and more traditional players to keep innovating and providing Canadians with safe, convenient and efficient payment options. Well, thanks, Andrew. And, and you mentioned ecosystem and that's a word that we tend to use certainly at Payments Canada quite a bit. And we're hearing a lot about the payments ecosystem is sort of more writ large. And to draw on all of your points in some respects, how do we, you know, we're in, we're in this time, uh, not quite as locked down as we were a couple of months ago, but we are in a, a global pandemic still. How do we balance the need for change during this time of a global pandemic when we have so many competing priorities in the industry and for many just to survive? And Doug, I'd like to start with you and your thoughts, please. Thank you. Uh I think the experiences during the global pandemic, at least what we've seen thus far, have been quite interesting. 
But I think from my perspective, not on a, not unexpected, but what they do seem to highlight is a lack of preparedness on the behalf of Canada. So Pamela, you spoke about balance and it's a really interesting word when it comes to the payment system. I guess, do we really have balance or is it just a reflection of a preference? I think it's actually the latter, despite the original attempt of parliament when they passed the legislation. I think to start, just because there are multiple public policy objectives for the payment system, safety, soundness and efficiency, doesn't mean that they're incompatible with one another. Generally, safety and soundness are tied at the hip, but far too often policymakers see efficiency as a trade-off. However, without efficiency, we wouldn't have the innovations that promote security and soundness of our system. So collectively, policymakers should be looking for that sweet spot. That Pareto optimal point where the welfare of consumers and producers is being optimized. I know it's hard. Safety and efficiency don't necessarily compete with one another. But sometimes it's a convenient way to look at it in order to justify there being no change. Like some would say, can't allow Paytex into the payment system because they bring, bring new risk. Full stop. And while I will agree that risk will be introduced to the system, there will be ways to control for it and still have the outcome of providing greater benefit to the users of the system. The payment system is and has always been about managing risk in order to provide improved services to meet the evolving needs of users. Nothing's different today, except maybe the systems are a little more complex. We have the means to appropriately manage the risk of these systems. Now we need the political will to advance the effort. Recently, Payments Canada released an interesting article about statistics, payment statistics over the pandemic. Three quarters of Canadians are reducing their spending. Two thirds don't have a dependence on cash coin. 40% reduced their usage of check. And 42% won't visit a store unless they have a contactless solution. So what's it all mean? It means that we as consumers don't trust paper instruments or devices that we need to come in contact with. So where does it leave us? Again, we are underprepared and increasingly lagging other countries much smaller and less sophisticated than Canada. It seems that we tend to hold out hope that the current suite of payment options will address our needs. Unfortunately, they seem to fall short of what's actually required in the pandemic marketplace. We can draw on the lessons on the global stage because there are many. Unfortunately, we're in a catch up mode and I don't think we're moving fast enough. So this brings me to my final thought on this, on this question. And it's about Payments Canada's legislative mandate. I think the, the attendees know they have three. It's to establish and operate the systems, facilitate the interaction of its clearing settlement system with others, and facilitate the development of new payment methods and technologies. And out of experience, I can certainly give you an A plus for the first mandate. But the same can't be said for B and C. Payments Canada has been a longtime supporter of the needs of Interact, and supported their development in ATM, POS transactions, online payments, email money transfers, and others. But the same can't be said for the smaller, lesser known payment services like Telpay, or offline debit solutions, or other solutions from some of the large credit card companies like Visa and MasterCard. Exercising their full mandate, PayCan can contribute to a healthy payments ecosystem and help to establish contestable markets for financial services. As the leading payments authority, PayCan can better utilize their legislative authority to issue statements of principle, standards, and policy to better signal the direction of the market, the market that they, they want, and that's consistent with their mandate. So without, before signing off, I must applaud PayCan's efforts to opine on the, on the new membership requirements uh, that they are considering for uh, Paytech and FinTech. I'm hopeful that this effort will send a clear message to government that the current legislative restrictions 
on membership and participation in the national payment system are no longer appropriate and must change soon. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. I, I appreciate the balance that you provided in both the, the, the praise and the challenge for Payments Canada, but also talking about the broader ecosystem. And, and I, I agree, it's there's there is a lot of balance and plus and minus there. And Sue, as, as a group and someone who works consistently with both fintechs as well as our largest financial institutions, I'm really curious about how your interpretation is of the, the question of balance, particularly in the pan needs of the pandemic and how things are changing. Yeah, it's a <clears throat> thanks, Pamela. Um, just listening to Doug, and there's so much there, but um, I want to sort of cover off four or five key points. Um, first of all, you know, as much as it is it, um, you know, with respect, you know, um, to those that have suffered, ourselves included, you're you're seeing our our new much smaller loft office in the background. Um, we've had to close our office and uh, and and we've had to uh, reduce our staffing levels. So you know, we kind of understand firsthand what it's like to what what it has been like to go through this um, pandemic and and have um, you know. Our business change um, drastically, um, <clears throat> but um, but at the end of the day, um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And uh, I really do believe that. Um, uh, you know, someone uh, else uh, I've heard say several times, you know, never waste a good pandemic. All those things sound really terrible, but at the end of the day, um, it does. Um, you know, this necessity, like when I think about as a as a consumer, the very first thing that, you know, we all wanted to do was get groceries, right? We were all worried about, you know, are, how are we going to get enough toilet paper? How are we going to make sure we have, you know, enough milk and all of those things? And my experience right off the bat, and I'm sure many, many others, um, is uh, when I went online to go and do my online shop, or when I went to the store, you know, the lineups were too long or the delivery window was two weeks out. And um, so necessity has us go and dig deeper, right? You need something, you don't wanna leave your house, you can't. Um, and so I stumbled up, up across an, an, a new entrant called Corner Shop. And Corner Shop is uh, new to Canada, not new to the, the delivery space. Um, and is a real contender to Instacart and other delivery um, platforms and um, was a delightful experience. And as someone who was a loyal, um, a loyal, loyal customer of Loblaws, and I still really love their products, Corner Shop is now my go-to. It's much more convenient for me. I have more selection. Um, and, and frankly, you know, Loblaws hasn't been able to keep up. And so the the challenge I think with you know the balance I think that you know you were talking about is some things just require us to be there right away with a solution, and I don't think any of our financial institutions were in that position. Um, I think that you know organizations like Interact enabled uh, you know the government and the financial institutions to respond quickly to the need to you know, sign Canadians up for, you know, uh, email money transfer or, or electronic or digital ways to receive payments. Um, but that solution was already in place. Uh, I think, I think that the, uh, the, the need for, you know, businesses to, um, you know, go from having a bricks and mortar footprint to having a digital online e-commerce um, platform has um, has made you know organizations like Shopify, you know, sort of the uh, the go-to ready solution for businesses. So if you weren't ready, and now necessity has made you you know um, need uh, a new solution, and that solution is available, um, then you know then um, nature takes its course. In financial services in Canada, we just don't have that ability. Um, and I was talking with my my son, um, who I was asking him about, you know, his views, because Lord knows, nineteen year olds always have strong views, right? And um, uh, you know, about why 
why why are you know your friends um, satisfied with the fact that there aren't any competitive um, financial technology products? And I know I'm being a little too you know black and white. Um, and he said because we don't know that they exist. And I think that's another big problem, right? Like, um, you know, pandemic or not, um, you know, we need competitive solutions so that everybody can be served in whatever way they want to be served. And that's just not possible in today's, um, in, in Canada in, in today. And so I think one of the reasons for that is because our incumbent um, providers have a lot of catching up to do. And, um, you know, I'm going to be provocative and say that I think that they, in some ways, used the pandemic as an excuse to slow things down even more. So, you know, why, why, why we would need to slow down the open banking um, discussions with an advisory committee about stage two of, or phase two of the open banking discussions, just because, you know, 100% of the world was effectively working from home. And um, like, there's really no reason for that. That was the reason that Finance Canada gave. And I think it is because the, the financial institutions had so much, have so much power that they have been able to you know, use that to their advantage to slow things down. At the end of the day, though, I mean, I think that they're all very, um, that, you know, they're all trying as hard as they can to shift forward um, with uh, innovation, but it just needs to move faster, especially now. Yeah, thanks, Sue. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting when you talk about slowing down and Doug mentioned risk earlier and we certainly hear a lot about worries about risk in the system and risk with new entrants and smaller organizations and how can they have a robust risk framework like many of our largest financial institutions. And I'd like to jump into that and dig a little bit more. Um, Andrew Holyom, we haven't heard from you in a few minutes. So let's, uh, let's hear from you first. What do you think when we talk about risk in terms of the fintechs and the startups versus not to put them in, in opposition, but when you contrast that, at least with our larger financial institutions. Well, th thanks, Pamela. So when I think about risk, really, I think about it across uh, three dimensions. You know, first, uh, I think about Canadians' general propensity to be risk averse. I think yeah. second, uh, cons as consumers, we tend to trust our governments, our regulators, and our banks. And then third, uh, I think about the imperative for us in terms of moving forward and where we want to go. So let's talk, let's start with a conversation about Canadians and risk. Historically, Canadians have self-identified as being risk averse across a multitude of dimensions. Take for example, a 2010 poll that was conducted by TD Insurance where 55% of respondents indicated that they were cautious or risk avoiders, while only 8% said they were risk takers. Regarding the adoption of early technological advances, a 2016 study from the OECD on the early adoption of the Internet of Things sees Canada not even in the top 10 behind such countries as South Korea, Denmark, Switzerland, the United States, in terms of the total number of connected devices per 100 people. We're cautious as a nation and have repeatedly demonstrated a willingness to avoid being on the cutting edge. Now, Let's add to that the perception that a significant number of Canadians have as it pertains to our government and our banking community, often citing as evidence of having the nation's well-being and financial safety as a clear priority through the handling of our, our handling of the 20, 2008 financial crisis, specifically how our associated regulatory environment, that is having a single regulator with oversight for mortgage lending and investment banking, provided such insulation against the kinds of losses, bailouts, and central bank interventions that we saw across the United States and parts of Europe. Now, as Doug said earlier, part of Payments Canada's mandate includes the establishment and operations of our national payment systems. And, and Doug, I certainly appreciate the A-plus grade. By the way, that's very kind of you. 
And our duty to the association states that the association shall promote the efficiency and safety and soundness of its clearing and settlement systems and take into account the interest of our users. Without a doubt, managing risk in those operations or any part of our mandate for that matter is of critical importance to us at Payments Canada and moreover writ large Canadians. Now, with that said, we need to press on and advocate for change like both Doug and Sue have said. And Payments Canada is in that camp. And we have been a supportive voice for payment for Paytex in Canada. More recently, as part of our the consultative process on the uh, changes to the CP Act, as Doug mentioned, Payments Canada indicated, and I quote, as a guiding principle, the government should seek to provide a level playing field for PSPs of varying institutional form, taking into account their specific regulatory institution uh, situations, as well as participation and opportunities in our payment systems. And a similar statement was made as it related to the future of RTR and its access uh, to PSPs and non-traditional players. So and, from- well, well, Andrew, um, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me and I appreciate absolutely we're, we're in it with respect to Payments Canada and our advocacy on behalf of Paytex. And Sue, how would you respond to that? Or what, what, uh, what do you think about those comments that Andrew made about risk and how we look at it? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, uh, I'd love to see a 2020 um, study on Canadians and their risk appetite. Um, and no disrespect to Andrew, because I, you know, I think I read the same 2010 study, but it just feels like 10 years later, there's, we've got to have made a little bit more progress. And, um, you know, we can see evidence of some of the, um, you know, to the contrary of some of uh, Andrew's points, certainly from a consumer standpoint, when we look at companies like Flinks and, uh, you know, Flinks is a, um, you know, a data company, and uh, they have enabled in the absence of, you know, the availability of um, products that consumers want via their um, banks, they have enabled the connection um, uh, of consumers to um, be able to use financial technology products with just their banking um, uh, account login information. And, you know, as much as none of us probably either are comfortable and or, or know, frankly, a lot about how that all works, one in three Canadians use it. So one in three Canadians use are, are connected and or use a connection to a financial technology product through their bank today. So I think there's two sides of that risk. One is that, um, you know, there's a risk that there's uh, data security issues. Although, you know, knowing the folks at Flinks and the investors behind them and the customers using them and the banks that they're working with, I highly doubt that. Um, I highly doubt that there's the risk that everybody, you know, likes to uh, to to say in quotes and in the media. Um, the other side of it is that there's a risk that, you know, this is actually an indication of what people want and we're not able to satisfy those needs without people having to, you know, um, do the to to work with companies like things, and then when I look at the business side, and you know we're we're a professional services company, one of the biggest segments of small businesses in Canada. Um, who knows with Uber with the Uber decision over the weekend whether or not um, the gig economy will continue to grow um, as fast as it was. But you know, at the end of the day, as businesses, we need you know all sorts of different kinds of payments capabilities that our system does not really support in a competitive, efficient, um, and cost uh, um, sensitive way. And I, I, I can sort of get into that, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a, on a separate um, discussion. But so I just, I, I think that the Canadians being risk averse is, is probably no longer true. I think that the um, another good example of of where you know Canadians are using products like prepaid cards, they don't know that they're prepaid cards. They don't really care. <laughs> they're just ways for them to pay um, that are you know um, more convenient 
for them that come with great uh, digital user experiences with, via an app, like companies like Coho or Stack or um, others. And um, we're using those products and that product is a workaround to those organizations actually having a banking license or, or a payments license to be able to do what they're doing. And, and there's a lot of miscommunication out there even about that. You know, your funds are CDIC insured. They're just not insured by Stack. They're insured by whoever is the issuer supporting Stack. So, you know, I think, I think there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of myths around the risk that need to be dispelled um, that uh, would probably help us all really understand the real appetite of consumers and businesses for um, a broader set of product offerings. Well, thanks so much, Sue. That's really helpful. And, and Doug, you started us off way back earlier in, in a, our conversation this morning, and I'll give you the last word on risk on this particular question. Your thoughts, please. So when I think about risk, I mean, the, the, the basic point is payments and payment systems are all about risk. The operations of the payment system are not, however, and this is the key point, the operations of the payment system are not about risk avoidance. It's about risk management. And far too often, the go-to defense for any change is that, well, that change brings risk to the safety and soundness of the system. If you really think about it, each of one of us that's on the call here today, we probably have a pre-authorized debit. Those payments bring a lot of risk to the system. And we've managed to build an acceptable framework around it to allow them to flourish, where today we're processing about 1 billion of those annually. And the sky didn't fall. I think the issue, and it's a repeat of what I said earlier, the issue is about will. Is there a real willingness to consider the payments issues and find effective solutions to allow new entrants into the system that can compete effectively with the incumbents? As you said, Pamela, or uh, Sue, you said, there's many unmet, unmet payment needs in the market today. And with the introduction of Payments Canada's new systems, risk can be treated and managed so much differently. But we have to start thinking differently. Now, a moment ago, Andrew also said that Canadians are risk averse. And I agree in part. But I think what's more important is they're poorly informed on the features of payment systems around the world. So we tend to make do with what we have in response to changing needs. I mean, for example, real-time payments. What we have seems to work for most POS applications, but they certainly fall short of driving new services, supporting new players, and providing each of us with global reach. Remember, it's not just about the consumers. It's about businesses that depend greatly on the payment system to move money and data. Canadian businesses are now competing on the global stage. It's sad, but behind all of this, the likes of Kazakhstan are actually ahead of us when it comes to payments modernization. Now, it's not important to know how we got here, but what is important is to get agreement that we can't stay here any longer. Innovation is largely focused on low value payments. And here, Payments Canada is looking to fully collateralize the new real-time uh, payment system, along with introducing many standards and requirements. So what risk is left? I suggest very little. So why do we have to continue the debate on access when we action is what we really need? So again, this is how risk is used. It seeds doubt. When I worked at Payments Canada, we often looked at the risk-related debates, had these debates on new services. The best advice I can give to you is stop looking at the risks as a reason for not innovating. Instead, look at the problem. Tell me how it can be done and then address the residual risks. Maybe the, maybe the key is to clearly articulate a liability framework for these participants maybe not unlike what they have in the United States, which is a framework that's open and fair and places the liability squarely on the parties deserving. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. 
And thanks all of you for your comments. Now, I really want to get to our audience questions. We have one more, and I see there's a number of them lined up already, which is fantastic. Keep them coming. Um, we have one more question to address to all of you, and I'm going to ask you for rapid fire results, and it's kind of a rapid fire question anyway, so we'll, we'll try this out and see how it works. Um, the big thing that we're hearing here, of course, is change. Doug, you just spoke about the need for action. Uh, you know, this is a big effort to modernize the payment systems in, in a full country and a nation, and it's a joint effort. You know, it always takes a village. So what can we do? There are people in the audience and they want tangible action steps. They want a call to action. So what are the things that we can do now? And Sue, I'm going to like rapid fire three things that we can do now. We can do now. I think um, we, like absolutely we need to generate political will for change. I think we've got it with Finance Canada and, and uh, the Bank of Canada in terms of their understanding of, of the need for change. And I think that what we need now is to create the political will for change. I also really think being on the Stakeholder Advisory Council that the stakeholders need to speak up and tell us what they want. And, um, and, and you know, it doesn't need to be that complicated. It doesn't need to be, you don't need to have a technical understanding of the way the payment systems work. In fact, you know, let's take a page out of design thinking um, uh, and tell us what are you trying to do and the more that we can hear about what you're trying to do, the more we can understand how we can um, help uh, provide solutions now. And so I think that um, there are some solutions like a sponsorship model, which we can talk more about that could happen now before um, you know the, the RTR is up, for instance. So those are my two suggestions. Two, that's great. Doug, what are your what are your top three things? What can people do? What actions can they take? All of our audience listening and watching right. today. You know what, Pamela? I I think many of these issues have been debated to death. Uh, I recall this ten years ago having many discussions about real time payments in, within Payments Canada. Have we not talked these things through enough? What we need is action, and what we need is my second point is direct access and participation on the part of the paytech fintech community, which means they need to be part of the regulatory framework. We need to advance those legal underpinnings. And then finally, we really have to take seriously the promotion of the public policy objectives, safety, soundness, and efficiency, but in terms of Canada, not in terms of the incumbents. When I listened last week to Adam Fileski, who was the uh, the CEO for uh, Portage 3, what he said is if the government doesn't change their view or we don't start treating paytech, fintech community differently, investment in this country is going to dry up in financial services. Investment is either going to move towards industries that the government supports or it's going to move outside of our borders. None of that is good for any of us. I completely agree. And we've seen over the years how venture capital, as an example of, of how a lot of companies get their funding and investment, has risen only to dry up and go south of the border or are really smartest, best and brightest people taking their great innovative ideas and either selling them too early, in my opinion, I'd, I'd like to see good Canadian success stories, or again, the whole company moving to the United States because that's where the action is and the funding is. So uh, really good points, thank you. And Andrew, three, uh, three action items from you. I know you're the king of threes at our organization. And so this, this one should be easy, easy peasy for you. So thanks, Pamela. I think three things. Uh, first is mindset. I think there's a, there's a mindset as it relates to innovation that we, it's, it needs to be a zero sum game or treated like a pie that's that's finite or limited. I, I think that's nonsense. I think um, innovation is a multi-dimensional and it's it's not a zero sum game. So we've got to, as a, as a country, we need to move away from that, that mindset. The second at Payments Canada, it's continuing to push on with the work that Doug and others started as it relates to payments modernization. Granted, a program such as these are expensive, they require significant investment and time. 
it is imperative for Payments Canada to keep pushing with that with our with our members, our stakeholders, and our regulators to see that implemented. And then third, it's amassing voices, continuing to amass voices like Doug's, like Sue's, and others in the paytech and fintech uh, space in Canada, as well as our members and stakeholders. Uh, to support and get behind the kind of changes, both on a regulatory, on a systemic level, so that we can realize the dream that was this platform for innovation for modern payments in Canada. So those are the three for me. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Andrew. And now we get to the fun part because nobody knows what's coming next. Your questions from the audience, and we've had a number of them coming in. And so thank you very much for those. So the first one uh, that came in, consumers, merchants, and small businesses all want more innovative payment alternatives and solutions, but our umbrella governmental and regulatory bodies, bodies sorry, reading, reading is killing me apparently, are dithering. Speed and innovation are almost synonymous and we are traveling at 25 kilometers an hour on a hundred kilometer an hour highway. And don't those people drive you bananas. <laughs> Who or what are the primary constrictors to our faster payments progress? Doug, I'm going to start with you because I have a feeling <laughs> it's going to jump right out. Yeah, you know, I, I, I can be, I can be critical. Uh, I think, as, as you know, I can be critical about the, the, the speed. Government, in my discussions with them, they're working diligently. They're working hard to try to move this along. COVID, unfortunately, has really eaten up the legislative calendar and caused delays that were really unanticipated. So I don't want to paint government with a, with a poor brush. However, what I would say is I think everybody needs to understand that these are critical to the success of our, our country, not of Paytex and not for banks, critical to the country. And we need to deal with it as a priority and allocate the right resources and get it done. Thanks. Sue, so your thoughts? So what's the constriction? What what is the what is the, the bottleneck in your mind? Well, I mean, I think the the um, those that are able to uh, create change and accelerate things faster are um, you know the Bank of Canada, right? Who ultimately provides the um, uh, direction to Payments Canada and what what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, and and in order for them to you know get their agenda pushed forward quickly, um, we need a, a minister of finance that um, has a vision for a competitive marketplace. Which uh, and so those are the two things that are really I think constricting progress. And I think both of those things, frankly, um, uh, are um, suffering from not so much, um, I guess, a lack of a lack of data and information about what you know competition can do and will do to both improve the performance of our banks and our credit unions and our insurance companies. And frankly, you know, I, I'd like to see a Canada that doesn't have oligopolies in every one of its major in industries. Um, but we'll stick with financial services. Actually, we'll stick with just payments right now. <laughs> Um, but I think that that's, that's the, the issue is that the financial institutions are doing a really good job of, you know, keeping the, the, the Minister of Finance and the Bank of Canada and, um, in check. And we need data. We need data to show them why that's absolutely not, not necessary and not the case. Okay, fantastic. Moving on to the next question, and Andrew, I'll start with you. What are the real safety and soundness concerns of allowing innovative companies access to our payment systems? Andrew? That's a great question. Um, if I think back to before we started RTR, you know, some of the concerns that raised, and, I, and I, I know we talk about platform for innovation, and I think about that broadly across all our payment systems, but I think RTR is really synonymous when we think about the, the real future and the, and the real set of opportunities. I think that coupled with retail batch I think some of the concerns that have been raised in the past, uh, it does come down, you know, it does come down to risk. Some of the risks, uh, you know, Doug talked about collateralization, uh, specifically around in our retail side, uh, that's been a challenge. Um, and then technology, there's such a, there has been such a concern as it relates to security, 
cyber. We look at what's happening around the world about um, threat actors getting in, uh, you know, getting involved. You know, we had the situation with SWIFT some years ago uh, in in the you know in in Asia, Asia. and uh, it, those have become a challenge. Now, what I will say uh, is that we are seeing where we've made we've made advancements. So you know, Doug talked about it. There's been a lot of conversation. In, in a lot of the areas of, of our of our modernization program, but we've made headway as it relates to the collateralization on RTR. We've landed on what that needs to look like from a with our and aligned that up with both our members and our regulators. And we're seeing obviously improvements and 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 enhancements around security. So I think those two pieces have been in the past some what I might call bottlenecks, but I see a pathway for those to be uh, those 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 issues to be addressed. Thanks, Andrew. And, and Doug, I mean, you were on the inside at Payments Canada for many, many years, and now you're sitting a little bit more of an outside, or a lot more, of an outside-in view. What, what do you say about safety and soundness concerns from innovative companies? So I think Andrew handled the safety piece that what Payments Canada is doing, the rule set, they can do audits, the attestations, rules and requirements and standards can deal with the safety-related issue. When it comes to soundness, soundness is about shocks to the system. And from a FinTech PayTech perspective, they're really not clamoring for access to the wholesale system. They're looking for access to the low value system, whether the batch or the real time system. There's not a soundness issue in all of this. So I don't know why we spend so much time talking about it when the, when the, the reality is it's not really an issue. Love it. Okay, so over to you. What do you say to consumers or individuals who think that our needs are already met? Like, why should we care? Why should we modernize? We've heard a fair bit about it, but clearly our audience isn't 100% convinced. So how about what you think about that? Okay, well, I mean, I have one suggestion right away. So any small business that is listening that would like to um, make payments and reduce their costs for making payments, go and check out Pluto. We've been using Pluto for over two years. It is, it is a phenomenal service. Um, they have changed their pricing model slightly, but it used to cost us a dollar a transaction. I could pay somebody 50 bucks, I could pay somebody 10,000, I could pay them 100,000, and it'll still cost me a buck. So that's, that's one thing. I think that you know the audience is likely people like you know, certainly not your average consumer and your average small business. It's people that understand this space. But I think there are competitive alternatives that for me as a business owner or for me as a consumer are, you know, more convenient, better, faster. And we need to, it's, it's, it shouldn't be only those few that get access to them. And I just wanted to add one little thing about your previous comment, and it's related to this, you know, in the U.S., and I was, I was uh, cheating and trying to see um, what the article was and who who wrote it, but it was about cabbage and their uh, delivery of PPP um, uh, funds in in the U.S. market and the fact that they've delivered more than any other financial institution and they are a fintech and and you know from what I can read in the U.S. the fintechs that have been allowed to participate in the distribution of of government programs have had to adhere to standards that they easily met. And so I think this just comes down to let's start talking Turkey and, you know, talk about the things that are out there that people would benefit from and understand whether or not there's really a true risk in dealing with them. I think there's, there's risk on both sides with, you know, payment systems that are very expensive and costly to maintain that ultimately can't be moving forward because that's not the world we're living in. We're living in a software world and in a much less costly world moving forward. And then there's the risk on the other side that, you know, people are not getting um, access to products and perhaps in some cases going out of business because of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can just say from recent personal experience, having not used a check or paper in years with a bank, I'm making a purchase and the requirement is a bank draft or a yep. wire, which yep. is super duper expensive and inconvenient. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm with you there, not to mention the organization for whom I work, very important. Um, Doug, 
your comments. You made a couple earlier, but your thoughts about what do you say about to consumers or individuals who really think, you know, it's actually, it's fine. I do what I need to do and really it's okay. Why should we modernize? Yeah, well, I think there's always outliers. Um, a number of years ago, the federal government decided to create the, uh, the Financial Consumer Agency because there was concerns about literacy, financial literacy. And I put this in the same bucket. I think Canadians are insulated against the options and the services that are available to millions, billions of people, rest of the world when it comes to financial services. You look to Scandinavia, they don't even have, they effectively don't have cash, right? Everything is electronic. We could move in that direction. We have the opportunity and we have the, the ability to do that. We, again, will. Do we have the will to move in that? So I, I think for those that are in denial about where we stand, I would just say, take a look. You can Google the payment systems elsewhere in the world, and you'll be surprised how low Canada ranks among, among the others. Okay, thanks. We're going to in time for one more question. Uh, so another rapid fire. Um, Governments are willing to work with pay techs and FIs, but there can be procurement challenges. Uh, many people and businesses who know who have tried to work with the government, the procurement process is very fair, but it grinds very, very finely and slowly. The best current option seems to be for a fintech to work with an FI or FIs that have partnership with pay techs. What are your comments? Two comments from each of you, and then we're going to have to wrap up for today. We'll start with you, Doug. Um, I think let Paytex try to develop a solution. You'll probably get one quickly and it'll be great. Um, but I think uh, the reality is Paytex are always going to need financial institutions because that's where the money will ultimately reside. So the relationship that exists between the incumbent financial institutions and Paytex will continue. I think you just got to give more latitude and authority to the Paytex. Thanks. Uh, Sue, comment? I have to admit, I'm not sure I totally understand the question um, because it 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 references um, the difficulty procuring um, stuff from the government. Is that have I got that right? No, it's the difficulty uh, if you're a pay tech trying to work with the government due to their procurement processes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think that's limited to pay techs, right? And. Sure. Uh, and I think that it is challenging. I mean, we've we've worked with a number of um, groups within the government. It is challenging. And, you know, what's rolling around in my head is the whole we situation, which is probably why somebody's asking this question. And, um, you know, I do think as a, and I'll say this more on a personal level, it it is really, it. I think we, we not, I don't want more oversight or governance, but, you know, a little bit of innovation within the government at the moment around, you know, procurement would go a long way. I am quite sure there are organizations out there that could do a way better job of helping the government to evaluate multiple options um, and, and ensure that they're following their own processes. Yeah, absolutely fair. And Andrew, wholly own, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think my, my thoughts certainly align with both Doug and Sue here. I think it, Payments Canada has had a long history of working with the government as a, as a you know part of our payment systems. And we've been able to work with them in terms of, of procurement. I, I do think uh, knowing people in the government that they are undertaking a number of transformation initiatives within their own ranks as it relates to moving to a more, you know, more digital focus and uh, seeing that perhaps dovetail with a procurement is probably not a bad thing uh, for the government as well. Thanks. And, and that's the last word on that. Wow. This hour has gone very quickly as I knew from the outset that it would. A lot to think about, lots of, uh, lots of things to reflect upon, action for government, access for pay techs, lots of innovation on the horizon. And I'm understanding we just need action now rather than I, I think dithering was one of the comments that I had <laughs> in there. So uh, thank you all. We hope you found uh, in the audience this session very engagement, engaging and thank you to my panelists and to everyone who participated. We will send everyone who registered a link to the recording of this session later this week. 
please share it with your colleagues and friends. We'd like to grow our happy family here, the ecosystem that is uh, working with the payments ecosystem in Canada. Our next webinar topic is the dark side of payments. I'm very much looking forward to that one too. And it will be on <laughs> August the 18th. With the increase in digital payments, the need to identify, manage, and mitigate payments risk. We were just talking about that. Risk and action has never been greater. We'll find out how at the Summit Series webinar number three. Well, I hope you'll join us. You can register on our website as you did for this one at thesummit.ca. Thank you everyone again for your time and your interest in coming out. And until next time, stay safe and healthy. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.